thanks to our sister Michelle, who always seems to get the uh, long readings that I assign for sermons. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last year, during the circuit breaker, my son noticed something strange. One morning, one morning, he shook me out of my sleep and asked me, Daddy, can you hear that? It was birds singing. And I really mean birds singing. I don't mean the Kowal bird. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't mean that, right? I mean, I mean an uh, actual bird song. <clears throat> right? Somehow, as the ambient sounds of traffic uh, or rushing commuters quietened down, he noticed birds singing in a resplendent dawn chorus in a way that he really hadn't had the chance to notice before. In 1962, the con- conservationist Rachel Carson published a book entitled Silent Spring. Carson pointed out the way pesticides were coming to dominate agriculture and were damaging not only to birds and animals, but also humans. Just imagine, Carson said, a spring in which no birds sang. It would be a silent spring. And if that spring lies in the not-too-distant future for the birds, how long before humanity meets its fate? First, there will be a silent spring. Eventually, there will be no spring at all. Those who started the Earth Day movement in 1970 credit the publication of this book, Silent Spring, with the beginnings of the modern environmental movement. We are into the last of our sermon series on creation care. The facts of the climate emergency are widely known and published. The recent intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, released their sixth assessment, which was released in August this year. And this assessment was described by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres as a code red for humanity. The rise in global temperatures, acceleration uh, at an alarming rate, is already having profound uh, effects around the world in acute weather events, vulnerability of food supplies, and rising sea levels. We face the prospect of a sequence of progressively extreme consequences. These begin with the prevalence of intense and violent conflict provoked as access to energy and safe places to live begin to reduce rapidly. They will eventually move on to parts of the world becoming inhabitable, species being decimated and rates of migration expanding beyond our current imagination. They eventually reach human life becoming unsustainable because of severe weather, the depletion of resources, or conflict over those resources becoming universal, permanent, and brutal. Now, because of the climate emergency, the phrase climate justice has emerged in popular discourse. Climate justice says that those who are most impacted by climate change tend to be the ones not the most responsible for causing it. There's an inverse relation. So, for example, a major drought this year has led to the complete disappearance of food sources in Madagascar. These famine-like conditions were brought about by climate change. And I don't think anyone here today holds any conviction that Madagascar is somehow more responsible for climate change than, say, Singapore. For climate justice to be done, these activists say, climate debts must be paid. Now, this morning for our reflection, I want to focus on a different kind of justice. Not climate justice, but what I call creational justice. And I believe this specific account of justice is found in Scripture and shines through particularly in the the passage that uh, Sister Michelle read for us today, Psalm 104. Psalm 104 has been rightly described as Genesis 1 set to music. The psalm uses each stage of creation as described in Genesis as a starting point for reflection. Days 1 and 2, for example, uh, in creation are covered in verses 1 to 4. 
Well, by the way, uh, as we go along with, in today's sermon, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open, right? Although I know it is a dangerous thing to ask because most of you read your Bibles on your phones now. So keep your phones open uh, on your Bible app because I will not be showing many of the verses on screen, will be, but it will be helpful to have the psalm on screen uh, uh, in front of you as we go through the sermon. Now, as I mentioned again, days 1 and 2 of creation are covered in Psalm 104 verses 1 to 4. Verses 5 to 18 cover day 3. Verses 19 to 26 cover day 4 and 5. And verses 27 to 30 cover the sixth day of creation. Right? So in, in, in its structure, Psalm 104 follows or takes its structure and cue from Genesis 1. Now the Genesis 1 connection doesn't just end there with the structure of the psalm. Old Testament scholars and historians point out that the creation account in Genesis 1 bears many striking similarities to stories of creation told by Israel's neighbours from the ancient Near East. For example, there are close resonances with creation stories from Babylon and from Ugaritic texts such as the Enuma Elish or the Atrahasis epic. Now, if all this sounds very unfamiliar to you, that's all right. What's more important than the similarities between uh, Israel's creation account and that of her neighbours are the differences. What's more important than the similarities are the differences. In the ancient Near Eastern account of creation, creation is the result of divine sexual activity and of conflict and war between the gods. Creation in those myths comes through repurposing what already exists, some kind of pre-existent matter. In Genesis, however, God is sovereign, self-sufficient, and supreme. He creates something. He creates everything out of nothing. Genesis 1 turns out to be unique amongst all Israel's neighbors' accounts of creation precisely because it alone unabashedly witnesses to the one and only supreme God, rather than a pantheon of lesser gods. The goal of Genesis 1 is not so much to be a scientific, blow-by-blow account of creation, but instead to review creation's source and origin in the hands of its creator. Like Genesis, Psalm 104 also bears many similarities with hymns from their neighbours in the ancient Near East particularly an Egyptian hymn called the Great Hymn to the Sun. Yet again, it is not the similarities that should trouble us, but the differences that we should look at. The difference between the Egyptian version is that the Egyptian version worships nature as gods. It worships the god sun and the god moon, for example. But Psalm 104, as you have heard, is resolute like Genesis 1. Psalm 104 is sure that there is an incalculable distance between worshipping the sun and worshipping the one who created the sun. In this regard, Psalm 104 is evangelical. It is anti-pagan and it is decidedly Christian. It witnesses to our Creator. This is its main message, to look at creation and from creation try and think through to the Creator. It is to look at creation and to explore what creation reveals to us about its Creator. Psalm 104 paints a more colourful and vivid picture of God than Genesis 1 does. The psalmist describes God in verse 1 as clothed with light, splendour and majesty. I think you can... You find that, that, that phrase, clothed with light, a familiar one, right, from the song, How Great Is Our God. And that is why the best worship songs take their metaphors and cues from the poetry of Scripture. God is clothed with light, splendor, and majesty. How great is our God. Not only that, He is not only the originator, but an ongoing sustainer of creation. God, verse 5 says, set the earth on its foundations and created, as verse 8 says, mountains and valleys to the place that God appointed for them. So that's original creation. God puts things in place in creation. 
calling forth order out of chaos, creating something out of nothing. But God also sustains creation, as verse 10 explains, making springs gush forth in the valleys. Or as verse 14 says, causing grass to grow for the livestock and plants for men to cultivate. So it's an ongoing sustenance of creation as well. Not only in originally creating the things there, but in its processes, how it continues to function and flourish, God also does that sustaining work. Now verses 27 to 30 talk about this in detail. And I'll read these to you. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. This is not an account of God's work as one time creating, but that every moment of our existence relies on God's power and spirit for sustenance. For existence. He makes possible all the conditions for our continued, our continued flourishing and existence. Here is a God whose love is not only generous, but consistent, trustworthy, eternal. He is not a God who rests on his laurels and creates something and then throws it away. Now, my son enjoys making Lego vehicles, and he takes pride in them. He isn't content with the status quo, but day after day, I see him tweaking with creation, with his creative, uh, uh, with his products of his creation, making sure it's in good shape, sometimes uh, improving on his design, and I often, very often have to order him to put it away to go to bed. And many a times, I have turned in the middle of the night and, and slept on one of his creations in bed with me. <clears throat> That's how much he loves it. Now, I want you to think of God on an infinite scale and, of course, in perfection, doing something like that with creation. God continually ensures creation's good existence. As verse 19 to 23 expound, God even maintains the trustworthiness of creation. The times of the daily, seasonal, and generational cycles are trustworthy, consistent, and discernible. He creates and he sustains with constant love. And God alone does this, maintains creation's integrity. My friends, I wonder if you, by focusing more on the providential nature and the trustworthiness of creation, would learn to discern God's loving provision and consistency in your lives. If you paid more attention to the fact that creation has an ongoing dependence on God, rather than a once and for all, here it is, I de I've delivered it and I'm done with it. But instead, if you saw that your life was a constant series of being dependent on God for its very continuation and existence, would you finally come to see your lives as not purely yours alone to do as you see fit, but to receive your lives finally as it has always been, a gift from God as the Creator? and that you belong and depend on Him for every single moment of your existence. Every breath that you take belongs and depends on God. If you're going through a tough time right now, I urge you, perhaps, to look around with renewed eyes as the psalmist does and focus on God's providence and trustworthiness based on what you can discern on what's around you. But besides God's graciousness in creating and sustaining all creation, Psalm 104 also speaks of God's delight and joy in creation. Verse 31 says it best, May the Lord rejoice in all of His works. God's delight in creation. But there is another verse that shows how God's overwhelming power is both formidable yet indulgently kind. Verses 24 to 26 celebrate the abundance of life in the sea, which is filled with countless creatures, great and small. And in verse 26, there's a mention of a creature called Leviathan. Now elsewhere in Scripture, in Job 41, for example, Leviathan is described as the most formidable of sea creatures. 
Psalm 74, 14 paints a picture of Leviathan having many heads. And Isaiah 27, verse 1 says, Leviathan is a sea beast or sea dragon. Now, in most of this context, Leviathan is a dangerous, powerful evil. Right? Leviathan is evil or a personification of evil. But Psalm 104 flips the imagery on its head, presenting Leviathan as God's own creature, which enjoys its God-given habitat, the sea. What's more, Psalm 104 says that God formed Leviathan precisely that he might play in the sea. Now, this one verse alone, verse 26, should help to correct decades of poor Christian education in which we have been taught to think of God as a sour-faced, calculative old man who sits up high in the heavens, taking note of every little infraction or mistake that you make. Aha, uh-huh, I see you jaywalk today on uh, 24th of November, right? Um, uh, someone said, someone opened the door for you and you didn't say you're welcome or thank you, right? <clears throat> If someone opens the door for you and say you're welcome, that's a bit rude, right? right? But someone opened the door for you and you didn't say thank you. <clears throat> and we've imagined that God is this giant calculative accountant of every right and wrong that we have made and every small little thing he will one day bring to account to make us miserable. The psalmist has no such illusions about who God is. God is the kind of God who creates and tames such a beast as Leviathan, for what? So that it might play and delight in the oceans. God is an overwhelmingly good creator who can redeem even an evil like Leviathan so that it can playfully enjoy God's goodness. If you need more proof of this, read verses 14 and 15. God has designed our needs to be met handsomely by the world. But not just bread, oil for our faces to shine. Although I admit my my face generates enough of its natural oil. Not just food, but wine, so our hearts are glad. This is not a description of pure functionality and survival. This is of a thriving happiness for creation. And it's not just human happiness that God is concerned with. Verse 18 says, The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the badgers. It is not that the wild goats travel around and somehow settle in the mountains. The mountains are for the goats. The badgers don't seek refuge in the rocks. The rocks are created for the badgers. God's design for creation is a truly joyful vision. The sea for Leviathan to play, the mountains for the goats, rocks for the badgers, oil for our faces, and food and wine for our hearts. This is a purposeful creation. Reflecting on this should help us place an emphasis on God's joyful intention and design in creation. Now, I think too much of the discussion on climate change is focused on pure survivalism, and the conflict that it creates, for example, between the young and the old. In, one of, in a very famous speech made by the activist Greta Thunberg, she says, you have stolen my dreams. This is not a biblical account of justice. The biblical account of justice does not pit the young against the old or citizens against governments. What Christians need to recover in these conversations is the true hope and joy that comes from the depths of our faith. As we have heard this morning in the narration of our Advent ritual, hope that rises from the darkness. This is the heritage of the Christian faith, a world made new and free for our delight, that God might delight in our delight. God takes joy when His creatures joyfully inhabit creation. My brothers and sisters, I want you to consider how you can work to help all creatures, great or small, even Leviathan, to one day find their place to play in this world. I want you to think about that. I want you to imagine bringing this attitude 
to a toxic work relationship or a troublesome task, asking God, God, how can I uncover the joy in your design in this task or in this conversation or in this relationship? so that all of us involved might delight in it. I believe that if you took this attitude of trying and discerning and trying to work for God's joy to be uncovered, you may find that life in this world is not as miserable as everyone says it is. And finally, in seeking delight and joy, we must be careful. The problem with us is that we have given in to the error that we are the centre of the universe. The problem with climate justice, as it's currently con constructed, is that it gives in to this conceit, as though human pleasure and pain is the most important fact in the world. It has rarely occurred to us to think that God made creation, animals, plants, for the sake of His own joy which he then generously shares with, his, with creation. Instead, we tend to think of the world as existing for our joy, our pleasure, and therefore for our use. We rarely think that God has created all things for his joy. Psalm 104 pro provides a vision of a perfectly balanced world. And there is a common symbol of perfect balance seen outside many courts. You, you might have seen statues of it or pictures of it. The picture of scales, evenly balanced. These scales are commonly called the scales of justice. And Psalm 104 outlines what justice really looks like when it, it applies to creation. You see, my friends, justice is not, about, not just about fairness or equitable distribution of resources, or paying debts. Justice, according to Scripture, is about right relationships, relating rightly to each other. Justice, in another ancient uh, construal, is about giving each person or thing what is due to that person or thing. I'll say that again. Justice is to giving each one what is due to him. That is to say, to relate to each person rightly. Justice is not only to be accorded to creation, to our fellow citizens or even our fellow humans around the world. The first act of Christian justice is to give God justice. The first act of Christian justice is to do justice to God. We give God what is due to God alone. And that is to relate to Him rightly. This is the profound, profound gift that Psalm 104 gives to us. It teaches us through a careful reflection of creation how we are to do God justice. Psalm 104 educates us on how each aspect of creation relates to its Creator perfectly. It is creation in its fullness and in its total package that makes it complete. Genesis 1 and Psalm 104 show us that God designed creation as a whole. There is a logic and plan to His design that can only be understood from the perspective of the whole and not just its parts. To care for the oceans alone, or for forests alone, or for animals alone, or for humans alone, is a conceit that we somehow know better than God. Every part of creation relates to God, and therefore every part of creation is essential to the completeness of the cosmos. The universe will be incomplete without Mozambique, or Madagascar, or Malaysia. It will be incomplete without man, but it would be equally incomplete without the birds, the skies, the fishes, and the oceans. My friends, if we are to do justice in our relationship to God, we will need all of creation. It is only when the entire cosmos is in right relation to God where true justice will prevail. How creation stands before God as a whole 
is of utmost moral and theological concern to us as Christians. In other words, it takes all of creation to do justice to the Creator. The psalmist points out that if we want to relate to God rightly, we need to relate to Him in creation as well. Whenever one part of creation is diminished, our view of God is diminished. It is to our detriment to perceiving God's glory if we do not take care of creation. I'll say that again. If one part of creation is gone, so too is that part of creation that reveals God's glory to us. So when one part of creation is destroyed, our ability to appreciate God's glory in that aspect is destroyed along with it. Ravens do not need to pray in order to live in God's goodness. They display God's goodness in their own ravenly ways. Insofar as the cedars of Lebanon are who they are, as the beasts of the forest creep about in their beastly ways, as long as young lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God, they all display some aspect of God's goodness. And they radiate something irreplaceable about God's goodness to us. If the lions disappeared, if the ravens disappeared, something fundamental about how we understand God's goodness disappears along with them. In fact, Psalm 104 suggests to us that God's goodness is so diverse, so rich, that it cannot be adequately represented by one single geographical feature or climatological phenomenon or creature. God produced this immense diversity in creation so that creation as a whole might testify to the superabundance of God's goodness. God's goodness is seen in the many diverse creatures and our ecological relationships to each other. Birds living in trees, goats in mountains, badgers in rocks, grass and livestock, humans and plants. The entirety of the cosmos is God's valuable possession and a manifestation of His extravagant goodness. As we close, I want to tell you that this vision of creation that I've just described to you from Psalm 104, and what it says about God's glory moves us beyond the horizon of obedience to God's call to steward creation. It tells us that the proper subject of God's attention and glory is all of creation. And so it calls us to do justice to creation by first paying attention to God's glory in creation. When we fail to do this, we are not merely environmentally unfriendly or selfish. Psalm 104 tells us that when we fail to take the status of creation seriously, what we are doing is committing blasphemy, defilement, sacrilege. In other words, to fail to care for God's glory in creation is to sin. Plain and simple. This is probably why the psalm ends with this petition or begins to wind up with this petition. The psalmist says, Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Now, in a, a, a whole psalm that praises God in creation, it seems strange to end with this petition, let sinners be consumed from the earth. But the psalmist is aware of evil in creation. And he asks that God will renew the world in such a way that evil will be taken out of it. Sin in the earth is the gravest sign of injustice. That injustice spreads like a pandemic throughout creation, infecting all creation in our standing before God. As I've mentioned, sins against creation affect our ability to appreciate our Creator. And so sins against creation really are sins against God. As Christians, we ought therefore to value the functioning of the ecological systems that we find in the earth because those are the best possible example of God's goodness that makes life possible and sustains its existence. Creation itself has a sacramental character as it constantly expresses for us in concrete ways God's invisible attributes, His power, His wisdom, 
his creativity, his patience, and yes, his love. Anyone who thinks about creation as a whole cannot help but sense and see the glory of God radiating through every speck, atom, rock, and breath of the cosmos. God's glory and power shines with the grain of the universe. No wonder the psalmist, when he thinks about creation, begins and ends the psalm with these words. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. My friends, this is what it means to do creation justice. When all of us, all creation, working together, inspires and resounds in praise to our Creator. If we live according to the vision of Psalm 104, and if we, if we resolve to take care to respect and uphold God's glory in creation, then we need not worry about the threat of a silent spring. Because if we live according to this vision and uphold God's glory in creation and all parts of creation with it, one day the birds will sing and us with it. And I close now with the words of Charles Wesley. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee changed from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place till we cast our crowns before thee lost in wonder love and praise my friends as we go out into the world to live and serve for his glory may you find in creation such a great and stunning testament that you are lost in wonder, love, and praise. Let us pray. Lord God, we acknowledge you are the creator of all things, the sustainer of all life, the beginning and the end, in whom there is perfection and goodness and beauty and truth and love. We ask now that you will renew our eyes as we come here in worship as a church, that we will have the scales fall away from our eyes and give us a renewed vision of a world made free, delighting in your grace. With those renewed eyes help us turn and go out into the world to live to serve to uncover traces of your joyful design always and everywhere in all situations and circumstances and when things get tough help us to look around to see the providence of creation the trustworthiness of creation the goodness of creation and remember that all these point to your providence, your trustworthiness, your goodness. And as we do so, let us be led again to be on our knees, lost in wonder, love and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs>